okay, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week I didn't get as far as I wanted to, and we only got through halfway through the chapter. That's kind of a strange thing. Um, so we'll finish the chapter, and who knows? I'm hoping I'll finish, go through chapter 16. We'll see, what, we'll see how, we, how we do tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're starting in verse 35. Um, as we've talked about, Paul writes to the Corinthians five years after they started the church. I, 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 uh, I think about that kind of stuff because um, when you're a guy who started a church, who's planted a church, you think about where, where are we in the process, you know? And so this church is only five years old. They've got questions. They've sent, they've sent a list of questions to Paul, and he's got answers. So that's kind of what this letter is about. He's, he's answering their questions. They've had questions about the divisions, the, the splits that were going on in the church, the issue of immorality in the church. He's had questions about lawsuits. People were suing each other. He had questions about marriage, questions about meat sacrificed to idols, which is really, it's not about idols, really. It's all about us learning to give up our rights for others. That was the whole issue. Um, the sixth area was about, we called it getting along. That's actually chapters 12 through 14, where, where you could title it spiritual gifts, but it's really about how the church is to operate, how we're to get along, because there's that... There's that section right in the middle, chapter 13, about how we're supposed to love one another. That's the better way, the more excellent way. And this last section that we've started back in chapter, at last week in chapter 15, is him dealing with the doctrine of the resurrection. And we pick it up in verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one. It's not a very nice word that he uses. Foolish one, un, a person who doesn't understand, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Now, he's going to use some language where he's bringing in farming pictures. He's going to talk about planting. He's going to talk about seeds. He's going to talk about things springing up from, from seeds to illustrate what the resurrection's like, because he's pulling some lessons from this. And um, you have to bury a seed for it to come alive. That's kind of, he's trying to draw that picture. Don't make too much of it. Don't try to say, well, you know, you don't really have to bury it. You could uh, float it into a glass of water or something. Or just, just go with this, okay? Why did I stick a, a picture of a coffin? Because that's what we do with dead bodies. We bury them, generally, right? Um, so he's going to be doing parallels with farming and with resurrection, verse 37. And what you sow, he's talking about sowing seeds, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. It says you don't sow the body that shall be. Um, some people have this notion that that the resurrected body has to be some form of some reconstituted form of the original, which kind of I think is where we get the idea of the zombies, you know, somebody that's half decayed or something like that, and then they're given life, you know, zapped with life or something like that. You're wrong. You're way off base with this. Paul says that the new body isn't going to look like the old body. The seed might contain the same DNA as the plant, but it doesn't look like the plant. You know, if I, if I was to take a seed that looked like that, now maybe somebody in here might be able to recognize what kind of a seed it is from the picture I threw up there, but I don't think I would have known that it's going to grow up to be an apple tree. You know, it just it's a seed. You know, I mean, experts might be able to tell, but this, the, the, what you plant doesn't look like what grows up. Are you following the parallel here? So, verse 38, but God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body, because different kinds of seeds grow different kinds of things. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. 
uh, all flesh is not the same flesh. A beef taco does not contain the same thing as a chicken taco. Different kinds of flesh. Are you with me? Okay, you don't have to make this too complicated. Okay, verse 40. There are celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. It's funny, I remember the first time I had Mormons come to our house, they make a lot of these fancy words, you know. And um, there's really nothing special with it. Celestial means heavenly. It means, it means uh, well, I don't know, I, I'm not going to give you the Greek word. It, it, there are bodies that live in heaven. Celestial bodies. There are terrestrial bodies. Terra, Mother Earth. Terrestrial bodies that come from, uh, sorry, bodies that are earthly bodies. He's going to use this parallel, uh, uh, heavenly and earthly. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. Now, the word glory, doxa, it's an interesting word because it carries different kinds of meanings. It's used kind of slightly differently in different places. Um, the root idea is, is means an opinion, but it can also mean splendor or brightness. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus shone in his glory. He lit up. It's like he was, you know, like the lights, like glowing from the dark. Okay? You could think of it that way. That's okay. That's a good, that's a good picture. But it also is used, this glory, we use this, um, it can, so it can talk about brightness like a sun, but the word can also be used to be talking about the exalted, resurrected state, our we use the word, our glorified bodies. Um, that's like, you know, that's that new movie, that last movie last year, The Son of God, after he rose from the dead. His glorified body, his resurrected body. And we use that same word, glorified body, there. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in in corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now we've talked about seeds, putting them in the ground, sowing them in the ground, and they spring up a different looking plant, okay, a different looking uh, thing. So here he contrasts what the two types of bodies are like. At, um, there is the natural body, and, uh, and when our natural bodies are sown, that means we plant them in the ground. We bury a body. And when you bury a body, it is characterized by corruption. It's getting old. It's decaying. Dishonor. You know, the older you get, the less lovely your body looks. It just does. I, I mean, even Jack LaLanne, you know, don't, you can be in your 90s or 100, you're still, it, it just doesn't look like it used to. It is sown in weakness. That's, that's what happens when you die. You get weaker and weaker and weaker, then you die. Our future spiritual bodies, what comes in, what comes up after you plant it, is characterized by incorruption. They will never, they will never, never decay. Honor, they'll be awesome, they'll be wonderful, and power, not weakness. Um, so these are, he's contrasting two types of bodies, natural body and spiritual body. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. He's quoting Genesis chapter 2 here. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, we already talked about this Last week, and at the beginning, of it, during the first half of chapter 15, he contrasts Adam, like Adam and Eve, with Jesus. Adam is called the first Adam. Jesus is the second or the last Adam. It's because they're the both. They both start things. Um, God gave life. He became a life-giving spirit. He became a living spirit, a living being. Nefesh. He breathed into him. 
God gave life to the first Adam, but the last Adam, he gives us life. He's contrasting the first Adam and the last Adam. However, verse 46, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. He's talking chronology. Chronologically, Adam lived before Jesus. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. The natural guy was Adam. Jesus was the spiritual guy. Okay? Adam was the earthly guy. Jesus is the heavenly guy. Okay? Are you with me with this? So who came around first? Well, Adam. Adam, was, Adam was, was made first before Jesus got his earthly body, right? His, 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 his human body. Okay? You're just talking chronology. Adam came first. The spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. But there's a parallel chronological with our bodies. First comes our earthly body. That's what you're in right now, your earthly body. And afterwards comes your spiritual body. He's just comparing. Um, he's using this illustration of Adam and Jesus. with how, with how He's just teaching little lessons about our resurrected bodies. You don't get your resurrected body first. You get it later. Because... Okay, verse 47, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So he's now... Again, continuing to contrast Adam and Jesus. Our old earthly bodies bear a resemblance to Adam. There is a little bit of a resemblance. Our future resurrected bodies, on the other hand, will bear a resemblance to, to Jesus, to his resurrected body. John wrote, 1 John 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Same principle, that there's going to be some similarities with Jesus' resurrected body and our resurrected bodies. It is kind of fun to look at the things that Jesus did after he raised from the dead, that we don't think that he did before he raised from the dead. For example, he seems to have been able to disguise himself at will. In Luke chapter 24, when he, he's walking on the road to Emmaus, after his resurrection, with the two guys, remember that? He's walking and talking with them for like you know a couple miles, you know, and they don't recognize him. These are guys that should know Jesus. And, and it's because he seems to be able to you know, I don't know if he had like one of those, you know, monster masks on or what it was, you know, or uh, I don't know. He just disguised, they, they could, didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread, until he allowed them to see him. He seems to have been able to walk through walls. In John chapter 20, after the resurrection on the first day of the week in the evening, the disciples were gathered and the room was locked. The doors were locked and then Jesus appears. And that's, that, that's the time where he shows himself to Thomas and says, put your fingers here and stuff. It seems like maybe like went through the walls or something. It seems he could fly. Why do I get that? Acts chapter 1. He ascended into heaven on a cloud in front of them. Now, I don't know if I'm making too much of this, but all of this, if we could disguise ourselves, it will... It will walk through walls and fly, we could have some awesome games of hide and seek after we get the resurrected bodies. Can you imagine the kind of cool games we could say, where's Rich, where's Rich? You know, and I'm looking like the tree or something like that. Wouldn't that be like the most awesome thing? Huh, Lyle, do you think that would be like, a, that would be like very cool? You know, I, I, okay, sorry. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption. These present bodies won't work in heaven. They won't work in heaven. They cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's kind of like an astronaut in space. You, an, an astronaut needs that special suit, you know, to keep, to stay alive in 
heaven, space. It's kind of like that. Um, Paul talks about in First, Second Corinthians 12 being caught up into the third heaven. There's three heavens we, we see in Scripture. There's the heavens that the birds fly in. There's the heavens that the stars and the sun shine from. And then there's that place where God dwells. So there's kind of some parallels with heaven and whatever. Uh, astronauts need a special suit to live in heaven. These bodies wouldn't live in heaven. I don't know if you'd like blow up or like you go and like, you know, uh, like cool some cool music effects. Like Maybe like the Wicked Witch of the West. We just kind of like, meh. I don't know. Sorry, in verse 51, I'm getting way off track. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Are you ready, Leanne, in the back? Okay. Uh, we shall not all sleep. I've kind of always thought this would make a great motto for the nursery ministry. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's a really old joke. So I thought I'd, I'd tell you as a man are a bunch of wimps. <laughs> I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. Um, where am I? Okay, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He's talking about, about the fact that when he says, when he says um, we shall not all sleep, the idea is that not every living human being on the planet will face physical death. Um, there will be a day when Jesus comes back, and not everybody's going to have died. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But everybody, whether you die or not, everybody needs to be changed because these bodies can't make it in heaven. Everybody will need to be changed. So in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. In the twinkling of an eye. This is the moment coming in the future, perhaps very soon, there will be what we call a resurrection. We call it the rapture. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, those who have already died will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. See, when a believer dies, your spirit immediately goes to heaven. The Spirit goes to heaven. We know this from Philippians 1.23 and 2 Corinthians 5.8, which says to be uh, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you die, immediately your, your spirit, you, your essence, goes into God's presence. And until the time of the rapture, we call this the intermediate state, you are without a body. At the time of the rapture, those who have already died, who are still don't have the body, but they're, they're still with God in heaven, at the time of the rapture, they get their new bodies first. And then those of us who are still around and alive on the earth, we get caught up and we get our new bodies. Whether I don't know whether it's going to be in the air or, or whether... I kind of wonder sometimes if it's going to look like we all just died. You know, I, I, I that's kind of the... That's the uh, the strange part of me. I, maybe it'll just look like, look like we all just drop dead because then our spirit will leave and get the new body. I, I don't know. Who knows what it's going to look like? But that's what he's describing. About That's what Paul's talking about in the twinkling of an eye. Um, verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Paul's quoting two Old Testament passages. Um, it's after the resurrection. 
after this rapture, we will understand that we will no longer have to face death again. You will never have to face death after that point. Never. The sting, verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin. I think that he's saying that this is because it's through sin that death gains authority over us. The wages of sin is death. Um, and here he says the sting of death is sin. You sin, the soul that sins, it shall die, the scripture says. He says the strength of sin is the law. It's not that the law is bad, but the law takes advantage of our sin nature in a sense. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. And it stirs, we get stirred up to sin. Paul says, I wouldn't have even known what it was to lust until, the, until I read the scripture that says, thou shalt not covet. So, so the law works with our flesh and we get all excited about sinning. That seems to be what he's saying. Verse 57, but thanks be to God. That's Romans 7, verses 7 through 8. Paul says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. What you do for God is not a waste of time. Because when you are raised from the dead, when you get the new glorified body, you, you will begin to grasp that all of the trouble you've been through, all the hard work, all the struggles, it's been worth it. There's a lesson. I'm calling it now or later. And, and what I mean by this is what, what are you living for? Are you living for now? Or are you living for the later? Some people totally live in the now. That's all that they can see is what's happening now around me right now. And so right now I'm a little bit hungry and so I get in the car and drive out to In-N-Out and I get a hamburger because I'm, I'm a little bit hungry now. I can't put it off. I can't wait five more minutes. I have to do it now. 1 Corinthians 15.32, that's the root of this philosophy that we saw last week where, where Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You might as well just live for the now. You might as well have a, take a, find as much pleasure as you can in whatever you're doing because there is nothing else. But the problem with that, folks, is that there is something else. Um, I... Francis Chan just gives the best of illustrations. Imagine. Now or later, what are you living your life for? I, I think that sometimes we kind of forget eternity. And we will talk about it when we come to church. We'll... Share our faith with people. We'll talk about accepting Christ because you want to live, you want to live with God forever in heaven. But are, are we really living our life aimed at getting to that other rest of the rope? Do we really believe that's real? It affects the way you live. And Paul says, what God has promised you he says, your labor is not in vain. You don't have to live like somebody else to get the best car or the biggest house or, or the, the fancy retirement package or something. That's not, that's not the goal in life. That ends at the end of that little red, that red part of the rope. Eternity goes forever forever now or later are you living for now or are you living for later chapter 16 
Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. Now, a couple things I just, a couple things I want to pull out of this. Um, he talks about on the first day of the week. Um, he is, by the way, trying to raise up some funds uh, because the church back in Jerusalem is going through some hard time. They're, they're going through a famine. They're going through total economic downturn. And so Paul, one of the things he's trying to do as he's traveling through the world is, is see if he could get some of these churches to, to pitch in and he'll take the money back to, to Jerusalem. And so that's, that's this collection he's talking about. And he's saying on the first day of the week. Um, there is a little teeny lesson here. I'm calling it church time. The church in Corinth gathered together on a weekly basis on the first day of the week. Um, that's Sunday, by the way. Um, there are some folks that feel that church ought to be on Saturday because we're supposed to honor the Sabbath and the Sabbath is on Saturday. And yet it seems that the church in Corinth met on Sunday because he says, when you're together on the first day of the week, you start putting this money together. Um, why would they gather on Saturday instead of or Sunday instead of on Saturday? We believe that the early church gathered on Sunday at, out of uh, remembering and honoring the resurrection, which took place not on Saturday. It took place on Sunday. So is it wrong to worship on Saturday? No, not at all. Is it wrong to worship on Sunday? I don't think so. I don't even think it's wrong to worship on Thursday. Uh, I, I'm not so sure about Wednesday. But uh, Paul writes in, first, in Romans 14.5, he says, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. You choose and then do it. If you want to worship every day, you can worship every day. If you are convinced you got to go on Saturday, well, then go on Saturday. You want to go to church on Sunday, go to church on Sunday. The early church, though, and the only reason I'm raising this is because there are some folks who get a tad legalistic and say, well, real churches worship on Saturday. That's a whole other argument, which I'm not going to take your time on. But verse 2, he says, to lay something aside... He says, as he may prosper. I'm going to talk just a few minutes about giving. Paul, again, is, is taking up a collection to help the poor in Jerusalem. And he gives a couple of guidelines when it comes to giving. Um, the first guideline, he says to plan ahead. He's saying, lay aside something ahead of time. That involves planning. That involves that you've thought about it. Giving should be something that you've taken the time ahead of time to think about what you're doing. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9.7, he says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. There are going to be times when, when there's a snap decision and you, you know, the need is right there and you need, you need to respond. Yes, absolutely. But as a general guideline... How does God want you to give? It's something you have to take time and think and figure it out. You have to figure it out. Um, you can't let somebody up front trying to pressure, your, pressure you or twist your arm or make you have to do it. You are the one who's responsible ahead of time to be thinking about it. He says, and he, so he says that, you know, lay, you lay something aside. You, you take time. You think it through. And then he says, it says to do it as he, lay aside as he may prosper there is a principle here about proportional giving. He says to do it as you prosper. In the Old Testament, you see a rule of giving uh, called the tithe or the tenth. That was a percentage of your income. Um, and this is kind of the same concept, is that um, no matter how much you are deciding to give, the idea is that the more money you're making, the more you are able to give. And if you're going through a rough month, then you cut back. That's what the percentage thing, how the percentage things works. So that if your boss only gives you half as many hours as you're normally used to, 
You don't feel like, well, I pledged to the church, so I'm going to give $100 a week, but you only made $150. Oh, you got to keep your promise to God. You don't no, get over it. No, a, a better principle in giving uh, that you should think about and consider is this idea of proportional. It's as you may prosper. Same idea. Okay, verse 3. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So the idea is they're going to collect some funds, and they're going to designate somebody to make sure that the funds get to Jerusalem, and they might or might not go with Paul. He quite, hasn't quite figured all that out yet. Verse, chapter 16, verse 5. Now I will come to you, when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. Now, a couple of things. It's kind of, it's kind of fun to track this stuff. He talks about when I pass through Macedonia. Do you remember where Paul is writing from? Do you remember where he is when he's writing to the Corinthians? He's in Ephesus. So, there are two ways to get to Ephesus or to get, to get to, to Corinth from Ephesus. You can hop a boat and go across the Aegean Sea. That's one way to do it. The other way is to travel north. This is, Ephesus is in what we call modern Turkey. Ancient days it was called Asia or Asia Minor. But this is, if you're going to look it up on a world map, this is the tip of Turkey. Turkey kind of com, comes out here like this. You can go north along, along uh, uh, Asia or, or Turkey and then cross, what's that, the Bosphorus or whatever it is up here, and cross over and go, go out towards Macedonia, which is the northern part of what we call Greece, and then, and then head south to Corinth. Now, um, that's the way he's going to do it. That's the way he went the first time because on his first mission, well, actually on his second missionary journey, but the first time he went to Corinth, he did it by going from Ephesus, going north, going over here. And actually, he actually made it to Ephesus, but he came from over here, went up here, and then came down. And, and what he's trying to do, when he says, and, and by the way, I am passing through Macedonia, because he's planted some churches in Macedonia that he wants to see. So on his way to get to Corinth, he wants to visit his buddies in Philippi and Thessalonica and, and, and Berea. He wants to see all his pals. He says, verse 7, For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay for a while with you if the Lord permits. Remember, he's talked about, I, I might even spend the winter with you. So he says, I do not wish to just see you on the way. I'm just not going to just hop in for a day or two and then just go on, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits, but I will tarry, I will hang around in Ephesus, until Pentecost. Now he did. He talked about. I hope to stay with you for a while. And and when and he wants to, uh, but he wants to tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. Pentecost is in the springtime. Okay, now try to fig, try to follow me here. I, my head was like spinning putting this all together. Okay. If Paul leaves for Corinth after Pentecost, and it's still springtime. He would be spending perhaps the last bit of springtime and summer and fall and winter in Corinth. So he could be like almost a whole year there. If he's not going to move on until after the winter, to winter. And the reason he would winter there is that his original plan was to go from, was to go from Corinth to take a boat and end up in Jerusalem. That was his original plan. And you don't want to be taking a boat in the winter time in the Mediterranean, or you end up at the bottom of the Mediterranean. He just knows this. this you can't buy tickets. You can't just, you know, it doesn't work. So he's saying, you know, I'm kind of hoping that by the time I get there, then I'll spend the winter, you know, I'll be there for a while. I want to be with you for a while. And, and there's a reason I'm pointing all this out. Verse 9, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now, where is he again right now? He's in Ephesus. And he says, a great and effective door is open. 
turn, do, if you've got a Bible or your device or whatever you're reading your Bible from, look at Acts chapter 19. And for here, for a few minutes, we're gonna, I want, I'm going to take you through, even though I'll talk about stuff in Cor- Corinth, I want to kind of <laughs> bounce things off in the book of Acts that will show you the actual historical things happening behind the scenes, okay? So look at Acts chapter, Acts chapter 19, and we'll look at, start in verse 18. Um, it says, a great and effective door was open. Paul's kind of excited about things that are happening in Ephesus. There's good stuff happening. A big door is open, a great door was opened in Ephesus. Luke records in Acts 19, verse 18, he says, and many who had believed, this is in Ephesus. This is what's happening in Ephesus. Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them in a total 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. We call this like a revival or something. God's doing a big work in Ephesus. People are coming to Jesus and they're getting rid of all their pagan practices. And in fact, these people still love Jesus so much they're just tossing stuff away, throwing it into the fire that could be... Man, this stuff was worth some money. Doors. God's opening door, or an effective door has opened. Sometimes when we think about what God's will is for us, we will use this term. God, I'm looking for an open door, or, I'm, 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 I, I, or God has opened a door for me. A- an open door is an opportunity. That, that's all there is to it. Nothing, nothing special about it. An opportunity that presents itself to you. We also see this term used when Jesus writes to the church in Philadelphia. He says, see, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut uh, shut it. I've given you opportunities. There's some opportunities for you to do things here. That's an open door. And so as we're thinking about this, you know, you could be thinking about, are there, are there open doors in your life? Are there opportunities to serve God that are in front of you? Paul says, a great and effective door has opened. Oh my gosh, things are really happening. Things are exciting here in Ephesus. But he doesn't end there. He says says in verse 9, and there are many adversaries. So I'm going to talk about difficulties. There weren't just opportunities in Ephesus. Luke goes on to write, look at chapter 19, verse 23. He says, and about that time, There arose a great commotion about the way. That's what the church was called, the way. It was, Jesus said, I am the the way, the truth, and the life. They called Christians the way. There were men who made their living in Ephesus making idols, shrines. Uh, That that was a a booming business. Uh, There was a whole bunch of pagan idolatry stuff going on, the worship of of, uh, Diana, the... Uh, or also known as Artemis. Um, and the fellows who were making their money made their living working in the shops, making the little idols, little big, little images of Diana. I won't show you a picture because it's actually kind of a little, bit, a little bit pornographic. These guys are upset because people would, would stop buying their idols. In fact, they're throwing out their stuff. They're burning the books. And they're getting quite upset. Talk about economic downturn. They were, they, were caught, they were very upset, and they started stirring up the people of Ephesus. And in fact, in Acts 19, it goes on to talk about how they gathered the whole, they, they took everybody to the theater in Ephesus. The theater in Ephesus holds like 25,000 people. That's, that's, that's the ruins of it today. It's huge, absolutely huge. 25,000 people, and it's not... It's not, I mean, it's half the size of Angel Stadium, but think of half the size of Angel Stadium. And they're all gathered together, and they're all stirred up, and they all start chanting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana! And, and the crowd's wild, and they want it. They want blood. Most of the people didn't even know what they were there for, but it was, a, it was, an, it was an exciting thing. Well, let's go on and cheer for Diana. And, and, and the Christians knew that if they got a hold of Paul, they would tear him apart. I find a very consistent pattern that when you choose to serve God, you will see difficulty. You will find trouble. Anytime the doors open 
and you think, I can do this for God. Do not be surprised that things get rough. Because there is an enemy who hates you and does not want to see God's work done at all. And we get so, so caught off guard. We're just so excited. Wow, things are happening. Things are so exciting. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And somebody comes up and slaps me in the face. And I go, oh, no. And I go off and I have my little pity party. And I, and I, and I wonder, what happened? Well, well, you're in a war. You, jo- you joined the army. You'd expect not to get shot at in the army. Expect trouble. Um, when, when, I, when, I, when people step up and they, talk to me, they tell me about things that they want to do, and I don't know that I've seen them experienced much in doing things, I, part of me is going, yeah, all right, and part of me is going, oh, oh I can, I'm not sure I'm looking forward to seeing what's up ahead. Right, Dave? Doesn't this happen? It happens all the time. I do want to encourage you to not make this connection. Don't think that an open door means it's easy. Don't think an open door means, well, it's just going to be fall down easy to do this thing. No. Paul says there's a great and effective door and there are many adversaries. Do not think that an open door means it's easy. It may mean that it's hard. All an open door is, is an opportunity. One other lesson I want to pull from this whole episode. Back when he says in verse 8, I must tarry, I want to tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. I want to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. The last lesson I want to talk about here in this this. This section, I want to call it detours. See, Paul's original plan was to wait until spring, because Pentecost took, takes place in the springtime, mid to late spring. And his idea was to wait until spring before he leaves Ephesus. But the big riot in, Cor- in Ephesus changed all that, and he had to leave early. How do I know that? Follow this. Acts chapter 20. Are you still in Acts? Last section in Acts, we're going to look at Acts chapter 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them, encouraged them, the people in Macedonia, with many words, he came to where? He came to Greece. And I'll just tell you, that's a code word for Corinth. Um, uh, this little thing, and when he when he's te- when we're reading in in First Corinthians about I I, I want to visit you and spend some time there, that's this is all that this is all that you get from it, is that it says he uh, he came to Greece. Um, this little phrase, it's all we've got of that of that episode, because things get stirred up in Corinth, trouble gets going in Corinth. And he has to leave Corinth earlier than he wanted to. Remember, he wanted to spend some time with them. And he ends up having to go back up north to Philippi. Um, um, instead of, he, his original idea was to spend all the way through the winter and then take a boat to, to, to Jerusalem. And instead, he goes back up through Philippi. Look at chapter 20, verse 6. He says, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas, and we stayed there seven days. He's making his way back. But he leaves Philippi, it says, um, after the days of unleavened bread. i got to tell you, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is also, it's another name for Passover. That takes place 50 days before Pentecost. So Paul's plans to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost didn't exactly pan out. By the time Pentecost came... Paul had already gone through Macedonia, um, down to Corinth, back up to Philippi, and he still got 50 days to spare. So he had these things all planned out, and it didn't happen. Where am I going with this? 
I am not saying that it's wrong to make plans. I think it's good to make plans. As long as you realize that God has permission to change them at any time. Because it's, it's fun to watch these little things, these little things in, in Paul's letters where he, he says, I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do this and then to try to track it out and see which ones actually happen. This didn't turn out the way that he wanted to. Proverbs 16.9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So don't be surprised if life gives you detours. It happens. An open door doesn't mean you won't have adversaries. And at some point, the adversaries can become too great, and you have to take a detour. Verse 10. And if Timothy comes... See that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Timothy is kind of his sidekick, and he will from time to time send him, kind of like his advance man, he sends him up ahead to get things ready for him. And so he's telling the Corinthians that his current plan back before everything unfolded was to send Timothy on ahead. And when he shows up, he says, verse 11, therefore let no one despise him. But send him on his way, on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now, verse 12, concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Now, I don't know if you recall at the beginning of the letter. But at the beginning of the letter, where we talked about the divisions in the church at Corinth, it was because people had their favorite preachers. Some people thought that Peter was the best preacher. Some people thought that Paul was the best preacher. And some people thought that Apollos was the best preacher. And so I imagine this is a little bit of a blow to the ego of all the Apollos fans. When they find out, he doesn't even want to come and visit you. I just, I just, it's just hilarious to me. It's like, he doesn't really want to come and see you right now, but he will when it's convenient. I don't know, I just, I just don't, sorry. Just, I find it humorous. Okay, I, I guess I have a funny sense of humor. Verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. You could probably do a four-point sermon right here. Only one thing I want to pull out is the phrase, be brave. Andridzomai is the Greek word. Um, it comes from the word andros, which means man. An android phone. It's a manly man phone. <laughs> yeah, but I'm an iPhone guy, sorry. Okay. Andridzomai, to make a man of somebody or to make brave, to show oneself a man or to be brave. I like the New American Standard. It says, act like men. I have a new definition of manliness. I'm going to play it for you. you do you know what happens when you, when you have a big uh, 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 a two-liter thing of Diet Coke and you have some Mentos candies and you stick them in? You've ever seen what, the, what happens when you stick a Mentos into Diet Coke? Oh, we have to look it up on YouTube. It's actually hilarious. Like it, like it explodes. You drop these little candies in, and it just watch watch this. This is the this is the best. This is these are men, men. I'm sorry, it's just this stupid. I don't think manliness means um, stupidness. Um, I do like. I mean, actually, the the New King James. It's being brave. Uh, General Omar Bradley, World War II. He said this. He said, bravery is the capacity to perform properly even when scared half to death. Be a man. Be brave. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Because you're going to face troubles, even with open doors. Verse 14, let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such, and to everyone who works and labors with us. Um, Stephanus and his household were among the first people to become Christians in Corinth. 
And Stephanus was even, we know from chapter 1, even one of the very few people who Paul had actually baptized. He says, they have devoted themselves to the ministry. I like, I like the old King James, it says, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I like that. If you're going to get addicted to something, get addicted to serving God, to serving people. And he says in verse 16, submit to such. Stephanus and his family are dedicated to serving others. So if you're going to submit to somebody in church, submit to somebody who is serving others. That's who you pay attention to. Some people just want to boss others around without ever lifting a finger. You want to ignore those kind of people. Verse 17, I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what is, was lacking on your part they have supplied. They have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. So Stephanus was apparently part of the group that showed up in the first place with a list of questions. He's, he's one of that same group. Verse 19, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Talks about the churches of Asia. That's modern Turkey. That's where Ephesus is. So they're all sending greetings with Paul. And he mentions Aquila and Priscilla. In Acts chapter 19, the first people that Paul meets in Corinth were, were Aquila and Priscilla. They were fellow tent makers with Paul. That's how they kind of hung out together. They all made tents together. And now they are living in Ephesus with Paul at the moment. And so they send the greetings. Verse 20, all the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. I don't think I'll talk about that. The salutation with my... <laughs> uh, a holy kiss. The salutation with my own hand, Paul's. Uh, most of Paul's letters were dictated to a scribe. Sometimes, at some point, he would stop and put his own little X marks the spot to let them know that he was actually writing this. Verse 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. The word for let him be accursed, the Greek word is anathema. You will hear that from time to time even in our English language, but it means somebody who is devoted to destruction. It's a bad thing. Um, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. And then it, it says, O Lord, come. And it, the old King James, it uses the actual word. It's, a, it's an Aramaic word, Maranatha, but it means, O Lord, come. A long, long time ago, Calvary Chapel used to have what they called Maranatha concerts. That was kind of one of our things, was doing these concerts. But that's because Calvary Chapel liked to talk about Jesus coming back. And so, and then somebody probably saw that word Maranatha and thought, that's a very cool word. Anyway, it means, O oh Lord, come. The Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. And amen. And with that, we finish 1 Corinthians. We'll start 2 Corinthians next week. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I would pray for those of us who are standing at an open door. And I pray, Lord, for courage to walk through the open doors. I pray for those who are facing opposition from the enemy, the adversary. And I pray for strength. Lord, help us to keep our focus on the future and not forget what we're aiming at. To know, Lord, that our labor in you is worthwhile. Help us to serve you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. God bless you.